Thank you for inviting me to speak before the Cincinnati Civil War Roundtable this evening. This wouldn't have been possible without Dan Bauer and Mike Rogers helping me get this far. And Tom Williams helped me immeasurably with the, my slides and some of the computer fi fine points. We're gonna be talking about 40 years in the life of William McKinley Jr. from the time he entered the Civil War till his death. Most people know only two things about William McKinley. Number one, he was a United States president during the Spanish-American War in 1898, and he was assassinated while in office. After my talk, you will know much more about him. The first part of my talk will cover the early part of his life through the Civil War. The second part of the talk will be after the war and his life in Canton, Ohio. Uh, Canton happens to be my hometown. So because of that, I feel I, I have some connection to the slain president, even though we're not a blood relative. William McKinley Sr managed various iron furnaces in Niles, Ohio. Niles is northwest of Youngstown. At the time, the population of Niles was only 300 souls. William Jr. was born in Niles on January 29 of 1843. He was the seventh of nine children. The McKinley family moved to Poland, Ohio when William was age 11 for better schooling at the academy. He took a special interest in math, poetry. His favorite poets were Longfellow, Whittier, and Byron. And he also studied Greek and Latin. He was a good student who enjoyed athletics and dancing. He was a member of the literary and debating societies. There is his picture before he enrolled in the human, in, enlisted in the Union Army. In the fall of 1859, he entered Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania. Because of illness, he left college before the completion of his first year. Family financial problems made it impossible for him to return to college in Meadville. He returned to Poland where he taught school. Poland was a Republican stronghold. The township gave Lincoln 336 of 430 votes cast in 1860, and also was friendly to anti-slavery speakers. A Methodist pastor baptized William as a young adult. Since the pastor was active in the Underground Railroad, that had to have influenced the young man. William's mother said that the family was staunch abolitionists and her son William, quote, imbibed very radical views regarding the enslavement of the colored race, end of quote. When William was age 13, he was very impressed when he saw a theatrical version of Uncle Tom's Cabin. At age 17, William enlisted in the Poland Guards after Lincoln called for troops. Here he is at age 19. When he first enrolled or uh, enlisted, 10 companies of Northern Ohio left for Youngstown and Cleveland to report to Columbus to be mustered into service. The names of the companies were changed to the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment. It was the first Ohio regiment to be formed for three years of service. Previous regiments had served only three months. The recruits reported to Camp Jackson in Columbus. The name of the camp was soon changed to Camp Chase in honor of Ohio's Salmon P. Chase. Ohio Governor Dennison appointed the officers. West Point graduate William S. Rosecrans was the colonel and Cincinnati attorney Stanley Matthews and Rutherford B. Hayes were appointed Lieutenant Colonel and Major. A few days after Rosecrans was promoted, he left the regiment. He was replaced by another West Point graduate, E. Parker Scammon. 
More than a month passed before the troops were issued uniforms and weapons. In late July of 1861, the 1,020 men of the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry left for Western Virginia. That was after the Union defeat at first bull run. The war in Western Virginia was measured in small skirmishes, but in numbing everyday brutality on both sides. Because of guerrilla warfare and attacks by bushwhackers, troops were later sent to protect Union loyalists in the area. Some Union officers ordered the troops to kill the bushwhackers in or to quote, burn, plunder, and destroy all property belonging to the bushwhackers and those who aid and assist them in the quote. The 23rd Regiment first real fight was at the Battle of Carnifax Ferry. During that battle on September 10 of 61, Cincinnati's Colonel William Lytle was wounded in the leg. After the war, McKinley spoke of the battle. Quote, this was our first real fight. It gave us confidence in ourselves and faith in our commanders. We learned that we could fight and whip the rebels on their own ground, end of quote. Carnifax is Latin for killer or an executioner. Early on, McKinley learned the value of being with powerful, influential people, which helped him throughout the remainder of his life. On April 15 of 62, McKinley was appointed commissary sergeant of the 23rd Ohio. Union General Cox requested that the men of his command move to the east to join General John Pope's Army of Virginia. Permission was granted. The regiment reached Washington on August 24 of 62. That was the first time that he had seen the nation's capital. On September 14 of 62, McKinley par participated in the Battle of South Mountain in Maryland. The battle was hand to hand with many killed by the use of bayonets. Lieutenant Colonel Hayes was hit by a mini ball that shattered his left arm above the elbow, crushing the bone to fragments. The regiment made three successful charges in the fight that cost 32 deaths, 96 wounded, and three missing. On September 17 was the Battle of Antietam in Sharpsburg, Maryland, the deadliest single day of the Civil War. The regiment suffered eight deaths, 59 wounded, and two missing. During the battle, McKinley delivered hot rations to the troops while he was under heavy fire. After the war, he was to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his efforts during the battle, but he refused to accept the honor. This is a bronze on a statue of Sergeant McKinley depicting his service at the Battle of Antietam. He's bringing rations to the soldiers during the battle. Two years after McKinley's death, Ohio erected a 33 and a half foot monument near the Burnside Bridge on the Antietam battlefield to commemorate McKinley's quote, valiant act during the battle. The 23rd Ohio Infantry produced two governors of Ohio who went on to become US presidents, Hayes and McKinley. Two Lieutenant Governors of Ohio, Robert P. Kennedy and William C. Lyons. Four U.S. Congressmen, Hayes, McKinley, Kennedy, and William S. Rosehands. Rosehands. And a U.S. Senator who later became an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Stanley Matthews. Second Lieutenant William McKinley Jr. He received his commission 
Once he received his commission as second lieutenant, Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes selected him for his military staff. Rutherford B. Hayes said of McKinley that he had unusual character for a mere business of war. Young as he was, we soon found that in business and executive ability, young McKinley was of rare capacity, of unusual and unsurpassed capacity, especially for a boy of his age. On January 7 of 63, Colonel Hayes appointed McKinley the brigade's acting assistant quartermaster. March 30 of 63, he was promoted to first lieutenant while in Western Virginia. The new state of West Virginia entered the Union in June of 64. A notice McKinley placed in the Mahoning Register published at Youngstown, Ohio, when he was re recruiting for the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry in November of 62. Recruits wanted to the 23rd Ohio. Lieutenant William McKinley, 23rd Ohio Volunteers, is authorized to recruit for the 23rd Regiment Ohio Volunteers. $42 bounty will be paid upon being mustered into the service. Report to Office of Daniel May's Drugstore in Poland, Ohio. The 23rd Ohio and the 13th West Virginia defended Gallipolis and Pomeroy, Ohio from General John Hunt Morgan and his raiders. On July 19 of 63, Hayes and his troops landed on the West Virginia side of the Ohio River and helped to capture 2,300 of Morgan's troops at Buffington Island. Here's the young officer as a staff officer. In December of 63, he was appointed adjutant on Colonel Hayes' staff. He turned age 21 on January 29 of 64. In March of 64, he was named Colonel Hayes acting aide-de-camp, as well as the, brigadier, the brigade's acting assistant quartermaster. The Battle of Kernstown, Virginia, was a loss for the Union. McKinley participated in the battle. General Crook's army was greatly outnumbered and had severe losses. 100 killed, 606 wounded, and 479 captured or missing. Hayes' brigade suffered one third of the casualties. The day after the battle in July of 64, McKinley was promoted to captain. While serving as adjutant during fighting in the Shenandoah Valley, McKinley had three horses shot from under him. He became a very skillful rider while serving as an adjutant carrying orders during battles. December of 64, Hayes was promoted to Brigadier General. In April of 65, his command changed and McKinley lost him as a mentor and as a sponsor. McKinley became General Samuel Sprigg Carroll's Chief of Staff as his senior adjutant and his aide de camp. During a 15-day period in January and February of 65, McKinley served on the staffs of four different generals, Crook, Stevenson, Carroll, and Winfield Scott Hancock. Here we have a photograph from Matthew Grady's studio in Washington, D.C. July 19 of 65, General Carroll and McKinley were relieved of their duties. At that time, McKinley was appointed captain of the 1st Army Corps, but on July 26, he declined the commission. He followed the advice of his parents who thought that a military officer during peacetime was not a wise career move. 
He returned to his home in Poland, Ohio in August as a civilian. While there, he studied law with Judge Charles E. Glidden in Poland, Ohio for a year. He then went to Albany Law School in Albany, New York. After law school, he moved to Canton, Ohio, the county seat of Stark County in 1867. Uh, Canton is located about 60 miles south of Cleveland. His sister and her husband were living in Canton. Here he is, home from the war, in the safe confines of a photography studio. He called Canton his home from that time until his death. He entered into a law, a law partnership with Judge George W. Belden, and he stumped for Hayes, who was elected governor of Ohio. He had a long relationship with the Beldens. I'll speak of that a little more later. I happen to know I happen to know folks further down the Belden line. I went to school with a couple of boy uh, Belden boys that were part of that family. The name Belden may be familiar because of the Belden Brick Company, which is headquartered in Canton. But I've seen construction sites here in Cincinnati that use Belden bricks. In 1868, McKinley became the chairman of the Republican Central Committee of Stark County. During the fall's presidential campaign, he organized grant clubs and spoke frequently on grants we had. He spoke strongly for military presence in the South to combat race riots and the activities of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1869, he won the race for Stark County Prosecutor. But two years later, he lost the race for re-election. Now, as a young man who's starting his career in law, he's trying to make connections. And he looks around at some powerful people. And he comes to find that he got to know a man who was a, the, a banker, Mr. Saxton. And Saxton also was a publisher of the Canton Repository, a Republican newspaper. I was born and raised in Canton, and I lived there until I graduated college. And during that time, the Canton Repository was still a Republican newspaper. It is still publishing. It was a, I believe, and still is a one newspaper town. And I think it is still a Republican paper. While going to the bank that was owned by Mr. Saxton, he come come to know one of the tellers there, Ida Saxton, the bank owner's daughter. In 1871, he married Ida Saxton, daughter of the banker and the publisher. They had two daughters, one of which died near age one and the other near age five. William, Ida, and their daughters were reburied in the McKinley Monument in Canton that was dedicated in 1907. But to get back to 1876, the Canton Repository endorsed McKinley for Congress and Hayes for president that fall. The war record of both men was prominently discussed pro and con in the press and at rallies. Both Hayes and McKinley won their races. While in Congress, McKinley continued to speak out for the rights of Blacks. Prominent Blacks supported him for Congress and later for the Ohio governorship. 
He hosted veteran reunions and spoke at many reunions, both in Ohio and elsewhere. In 1877, he was the main speaker at a reunion of the 23rd Ohio Regiment that was hosted by President Hayes in Fremont, Ohio. It was attended by Secretary of War George Washington McCrary, Chief Justice of the U.S. Morrison R. Waite, and Union Generals Sheridan, Rosecrans, Garfield, Cox, Scammon, Duval, and Carroll. In 1880, he hosted a reunion in Canton. The guest lists include Generals Crook, Sherman, President Hayes, and James A. Garfield, who was running for president at the time. In 1891, he was a candidate for the Ohio governor. A little bit about the sociology at that time. John P. Green, a Cleveland attorney who had served in both houses of the Ohio legislature, was another black man who strongly supported McKinley's candidacy for governor. During the campaign, Green, who was the author of the bill making Labor Day, a legal holiday in Ohio, was invited to speak at a Labor Day celebration in Cincinnati. But when he arrived in the city, he was denied entrance to the prestige, to the dining room at the prestige hotel, prestigious hotel in Cincinnati, the Gibson House, and defiantly moved to another hotel. McKinley was also to speak at the celebration. Local Republicans quickly canceled McKinley's reservations at the Gibson House and arranged rooms for him and, and Green, where, where Green and he was staying. The next day, McKinley and Green rode together in a parade and were loudly cheered. A reporter wrote that, quote, McKinley's con conduct has set the colored population wild. His name was heard on all sides and casual groups of colored men on the streets cheer it at every opportunity. When he was inaugurated as governor on January 11, 1892, 3,000 Ohio soldiers participated in the parade. He liked to be among soldiers and a military presence marked both of his terms as governor. The 1890s were not all gilded age in the good old days. As governor, he was in charge of the Ohio National Guard. The Ohio National Guard was called to active duty 15 times during McKinley's second term as governor. This is from the book, Major McKinley. Major fires in Springfield and Toledo lynch mobs and labor disturbances, especially among coal miners, created demands for order that local authorities were unable to meet. And McKinley called the guard into service repeatedly. And one time, 3,647 guardsmen were on duty, patrolling what was said to be the largest area under military occupation since the Civil War. The guard was called out three times to protect prisoners against lynch mobs. On one of these occasions at Washington Courthouse in October of 94, the sheriff called out the local company when a crowd threatened William Dolby, a black man accused of raping a white woman and under arrest for the crime. Two additional companies under the command of Colonel Alonzo B. Coit were sent from Columbus the next morning. A mob of 2,000 defied Coit, calling out, hang the colonel if he won't give us that blank, blank nigger, end of quote. During the confrontation with the mob, the guardsmen fired on it, killing five and wounding more than a dozen others. The arrival of still more troops finally restored order. McKinley was out of state at the time of the shootings, but he strongly supported Coit and the actions of the guard in protecting the prisoners. He said, 
lynching cannot be tolerated in Ohio. The law of the state must be supreme over all. And the agents of the law acting within the law must be sustained. McKinley also called the guard out to deal with frequent labor disturbances among Ohio's coal miners, not as strike breakers, but simply to preserve public order. He preferred arbitration in labor disputes and was cautious about dispatching troops. But when the disputes turned violent, when coal tipples and bridges were burned and miners who continued to work were attacked, he sent the guard out in force, dispatching it quickly by rail, hoping to overawe the strikers and avoid bloodshed. One train alone carried 12 to 1,500 men, two Gatling guns, batteries, brass guns, ammunition, and equipment. Pontoon bridges, pickets, a field telegraph office, and signal lights soon dotted the countryside. McKinley said he had noted during the war that fighting was avoided when a brigade found itself confronted by the strength of a division. He said that these outages must, uh, outrages must stop if it takes every soldier in Ohio. Feeling at ease in military matters, McKinley took personal control of the operations and was in constant telegraphic communication with commanders in the field. At one time, he kept close watch over the troops for 16 days, often remaining in his office long after midnight, sometimes telegraphing instructions as late as 3 a.m. The result of his diligence was that peace was quickly restored without bloodshed throughout the state. McKinley's military record and support among veterans were significant factors in his campaign for the presidency in 1896. Harper's Weekly ran a cartoon dated 1861 with McKinley in the uniform of a private and William Jennings Bryan in the cradle at 14 months. Former Union General Daniel Sickles, Horace Porter, Fran Siegel, Frederick Grant, O. O. Howard, and John C. Robinson campaigned for McKinley. He ran his campaign for the presidency from his home in Canton, which was the site of his front porch campaign. Crowds of newspaper reporters came to his front porch to see him and to support him. Here is a picture of the front porch campaign in Canton. By coincidence, I was born on the site of the front porch campaign. By the time I entered the world in Canton, Ohio, this house was no longer there. It was replaced by Mercy Hospital, a Catholic run hospital. That hospital has since been torn down. And last I knew it was replaced on that site by a public library. Across the street from that house, where that house had been in the 1920s built McKinley High School. I and my mother both graduated from McKinley High School. That high school the building is still there, but it is now a retirement and nursing home. A newer McKinley High School has since been built and it is located about 20 blocks away, sitting next to the stadium where the Football Hall of Fame is located and where the, the Hall of Fame football game is played. A little about the election of 1896. 
his opponent was William Jennings Bryant. And Bryant's platform in 96 was running against McKinley from the book 1912 by James Chase. I'd like to quote what is, I believe, the best explanation of the principle of sound money. Since the founding of the Populist Party in 1892, the issue of free silver had been at the heart of the party's beliefs. For 30 years, the dollar had strengthened under the system of tying the dollar to the gold standard, a sound money position that was supported by the bankers and industrialists of the East. During this time period, the cotton growing farmers in the South and the wheat growers in the West saw a fall in the prices of their products. Moreover, farmers were mostly debtors and their long-term indebtedness was increasing. For example, a debt that could have been covered in 1865 with a thousand bushels of wheat now cost 3000 bushels. To many farmers, the remedies for this situation was simple. If money was scarce, increase the money supply. Silver was cheap and plentiful. And by adopting a policy of bimetallism, linking the dollar to silver and gold at a 16 to one ratio, the currency would inflate and the cost of paying long-term debt would diminish. The free coinage of silver seemed the answer as long as the silver dollar was worth intrinsically less than the gold dollar. At the Democratic Convention, Bryan's speech electrified the delegates as he famously cried out, quote, you shall not press upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. Today, farmers are concerned about falling soybean and wheat prices. McKinley won the 1896 election and carried the eight major industrialized states. A little bit more about the campaign. Here's a group of Pennsylvania women coming to the front porch in support. Notice in the middle of the front row is McKinley and his wife, Ida. Keep in mind, this is his first run for the presidency in 96. How many of these women actually, they supported him, but how many of them voted for him? You should know that, zero because women didn't get the vote until 1920. Republican McKinley was the candidate of the nation's money interests, yet he had a knack for reaching out to the common man. His campaign for the presidency was run from his home in Canton from his front porch. On one day, 16 delegations from 12 states arrived in Canton to hear him speak from his porch. Between June 19 and November 2 of 96, nearly 750,000 people in 300 delegations from 30 states made the pilgrimage to McKinley's front porch. Cleveland industrialist and Ohio Senator Mark Hanna was McKinley's campaign manager and was his link to Wall Street. McKinley also knew that he was no match as a speaker to his Democratic opponent, the boy or order of the Platte, William Jennings Bryan. Another reason he stayed at his front porch was he also needed to be near his wife, which helped give him some sympathy vote. She was an epileptic. She suffered from epilepsy. 
Brian's campaign raised $425,000 campaigning for free silver. McKinley's campaign raised $3.5 million campaigning to keep the gold standard. The electoral votes, McKinley 271, Brian 176. The popular vote, McKinley 7.1 million, Brian 6.5 million. The evening before the inauguration, McKinley spent time with outgoing Democratic President Grover Cleveland. The most important issue on McKinley's mind was the threatened war with Spain. As president, McKinley wanted to extend America's influence abroad, not by politics or by gaining territory. His goal was to establish commercial hegemony and to expand markets for American made goods. He believed that all that was needed was reliable and protected trading routes and political and economic stability with America's trading partners. During the 1890s, Japan and Germany were in an expansionist mode in both Africa and China. Some in the US government believed that the United States needed to catch up. That the spoils of the Spanish-American War included Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam. Guam was halfway between Hawaii and the Philippines, and it was needed to be used as a coaling and supply station for the US Navy in the Pacific. Hawaii had been acquired before 1898. Two members of his administration, General Leonard Wood and Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, were pushing McKinley to go to war with Spain. He told Wood, I shall never get into a war until I am sure that God and man approve. I've been through one war, I've seen the dead piled up. I do not want to see another. The book, The War Lovers, goes into great detail about the run-up of the Spanish-American War, how McKinley was pressured to enter the war. On February 15 of 98, the U.S. Navy cruiser Maine explodes while docked in the Havana Harbor. Of the 354 officers and crew on the ship, 266 died then or shortly thereafter. At the time, the U.S. had only 25,000 armed troops. The U.S. Navy had four first-class battleships, one second-class battleship, two armed cruisers, and the rest of the fleet was a collection of monitors and protected cruisers. A Naval Board of Inquiry found that the explosion was caused by a low-grade underwater mine. Spain was blamed for the sinking of the Maine, with William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer fanned the war fever in their New York newspapers. The story sent circulation of both newspapers soaring. Pulitzer's paper circulation more than doubled to over a million. Congress authorized $50 million for national defense without issuing bonds or authorizing new taxes. McKinley told Senator Charles Fairbanks, a Republican from Indiana, and a leading conservative on February 17. I don't propose to be swept off my feet by the catastrophe. My duty is plain. We must learn the truth and endeavor, if possible, to fix responsibility. The country can afford to withhold its judgment and not strike an avenging blow. Until the truth is known, 
The administration will go on preparing for war, but still hoping to avert it. It will not be plunged into war until it is ready for it. War with Spain was declared on April 25. Between 1895 and 1898, U.S. Navy ships suffered 12 coal bunker fires, some of which were caused by spontaneous combustion. The Maine, like several other ships, suffered from a design flaw that made it especially vulnerable. The coal bunkers and the magazines shared a, bu a bulkhead through which heat might pass and ignite the ammunition. During the 1970s, Admiral William Hyman Rickover ordered a naval engineer and an explosives expert to use modern analytical techniques to study pictures taken of the main wreckage in 1911. They determined that the explosion was caused by spontaneous combustion in a coal bunker. The explosion was not caused by actions of the Spanish Navy. Can you say weapons of mass destruction? When I was living in Canton, there was wreckage of the USS Maine, of the conning tower. And the only signage was to that effect. Conning Tower, USS Maine, remember the Maine. When I was there visiting in 2011, I was going through the park system where the that monument was located, and I couldn't find it. So I did an inquiry, and I found out that it the monument had been moved a few blocks away to a Veterans Memorial Park. And the new location has up-to-date signage that says that the USS Maine was not sunk by Spain, but by spontaneous combustion. I'll show you pictures of that in a moment. McKinley spent the summer of 1899 at his home in Canton, where he received the official notification of his nomination for a second term as president. His home was equipped with a long distance telephone that allowed him to keep informed about the situation of the American forces he had ordered to China to help suppress the Boxer Rebellion. In 1900, mining engineer Herbert Hoover and his bride Lou were on their honeymoon in China. So Hoover could search for minerals, including gold. He had to seek shelter at the American English compound as it was attacked by the boxers. American troops rescued those who were being attacked by the boxers. Vice President Garrett Hobart died of a heart ailment on November 21 of 1899. His position was filled by Theodore Roosevelt, who had been serving as governor of New York. In that capacity as governor, Roosevelt was at odds with the political bosses. And the political bosses kicked Roosevelt upstairs to the White House. As commander in chief, McKinley had overseen military governments in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines long after the war with Spain was over. And military action continued throughout his presidency. The war in the Philippines was not ended until his death, until after his death. American troops were in Cuba until 1922. The U.S. naval base at Guantanamo is still there. And the last U.S. troops left the Philippines in 1946. Military displays marked his second inauguration as president in 1901. Naval warships steamed up the Potomac River for the event with Admiral George Dewey in command. The parade included more than 1,000 Civil War veterans and 4,000 soldiers. Here we have a picture of the First Lady, Ida Saxton McKinley. Here she is as First Lady, and here is the first couple at a dinner party during the presidency. McKinley was always comfortable 
and spent much time as a civilian with military people. And he attended many Grand Army of the Republic veterans reunions. This picture was on display at the uh, McKinley Museum in Canton. Here is the official presidential portrait. The 1890s saw much labor unrest against business owners. Many of the large companies were run by the robber barons. This gave rise to socialism and anarchism. A leading anarchist of the late 1890s was Emma Goldman. She was a major influence on Detroit born. Leon Zolgaz, and that name is spelled C-Z-O-L-G-O-S-Z. -Z. Leon's parents were Polish immigrants who settled on a farm they owned in Warrensville, Ohio, which is located southeast of Cleveland. Leon lived there for the last several years of his life while he got more interested in anarchy and the writings and speeches of Emma Goldman. The book, The President and the Assassin, McKinley, Terror and Empire at the dawn of the American century was published in 2011, and it tells much about the social upheaval and what was happening and the rush for empire during the early 1900s. McKinley's last trip was to Buffalo, New York to attend the Pan American Exposition. While McKinley was greeting the public of the exposition, the hearing is delivering his last speech on September 5 of 01. When he was greeting the public at the exposition on September 6, Zolgaz shot the president twice at point blank range. This is a depiction of that. The president died of his wounds September 14. Zolgaz was immediately captured and tried for the murder in a New York court. As an anarchist, he refused to defend himself and said that he had, quote, done my duty, end of quote. He was executed by electrocution by order of the court, October 29, 1901. The president's funeral train went from Buffalo to Washington, D.C., and on to his home in Canton. The funeral was held at the First Methodist Church in downtown Canton, just a few doors away from the county courthouse where McKinley practiced law. His body was placed in a vault in West Lawn Cemetery where it was guarded by a contingent of 80 federal soldiers housed in wooden barracks erected in the cemetery. The contingent was later reduced in number, continued to guard the vault until 1907. In that year, a large monument was dedicated, which houses the remains of William, Ida, and their two daughters. This is a 1905 picture, Lucas County Courthouse in Adams, on Adams Street in Toledo, with a statue of the slain president. Here's the State House in Columbus. And here we have the 1934 $500 Federal Reserve note. Henry Morgenthau, Jr., Treasury Secretary. A couple of years ago, I was going through the Warren County Historical Society, which is a couple doors down the hill from the Golden Lamb in Lebanon, Ohio. And I found this commemorative plate. And it reads, it is God's way, his will be done. And it has the year he was born and the year he died. And here we have a postcard that I purchased at the McKinley Museum in Canton. And this is the front, the famous home, McKinley's home in Canton, without the gang of supporters during the election. After Ida left the White House, she returned to her father's home, the Saxton home, in Canton, where she lived for the rest of her days as an invalid because of epilepsy. I mentioned that the Judge Belden, who had been McKinley's law partner, and that I went to school with descendants of his, the brothers 
uh, of the Belden family. When one of the Belden men in the 1970s, I believe, 70s, early 80s, learned that the Saxton home was going to meet the fate of the wrecking ball. He helped save the building in the Saxton home. And he remembered sliding down a banister in the Saxton home when he was a boy. The McKinley home was moved to the park system, but it deteriorated and was vandalized and later raised during the winter of 1934 and 35. Today, the McKinley Presidential Library and Museum houses the collection of the president's mem memorabilia, and it is at the base of the McKinley Monument. The National First Ladies Library and the First Ladies Museum are a block apart in downtown Canton, a block south of the courthouse the 205 Market Street is the National First Lady's Library, and that's in what had been a seven-story bank building. And the Saxton home is the First Lady's Museum. It's at 331 South Market Avenue. So they're just a block apart. And to tour both buildings you start at the bank the seven story bank building you buy your ticket for the museum and then you walk the, the short block to the saxton home this is the mckinley national monument memorial in canton there's over a hundred steps there the mr and mrs mckinley and their two daughters are buried inside the the building you don't have to walk the hundred steps. There's now a parking lot uh, to the side of the uh, hill, hillside about halfway up the steps. So you can park there and walk through the parking lot. It's a much easier way to get there. At the base of the monument to the side is the County Historical, Sark County Historical Society and the McKinley Library and Museum. I mentioned the memorial to the USS Maine. This picture was taken approximately between 1912 and 1914. I don't know who the little boy in the front and the two women are. But the man at the left, the boy at the left, at the top of the picture is my father, who was born in Canton. And to his right, uh, to his left, our right, is his older brother, who was born in 1900. My father was born in 1904. When I was in Canton, I believe it was 2011, visiting. I was looking for the monument. I wanted to show it to my wife who was not raised in Northern Ohio and I couldn't find it. So when I was at the McKinley Museum, I asked what happened to it. And they told me it was moved a few blocks away to a veterans memorial park. So I went to go see it and this is what it looks like today. The base of the conning tower, USS Battleship Maine. And that's me in front of the memorial. So these two pictures were taken approximately 100 years apart. A little hometown pride. If you were to visit Canton, Ohio, there's six things I recommend you might want to see. The first is the First Lady's Library at 2nd and Market South, the former seventh story bank building. And then a block south from there is the First Lady's Museum 
in the former Saxton home at 3rd and Market South. There's a classic car museum on 6th Street Southwest. That's a, those three are all within walking distance in downtown Canton. The McKinley Grand Hotel is the major nice modern hotel in downtown Canton, and it's located across the street from the First Ladies Museum. The fourth and fifth things to see, the McKinley Monument and the Presidential Library and Museum in Monument Park, which is off of South 12th Street Northwest. And for those of you who are football fans, Canton is the home of the Professional Football Hall of Fame off 25th Street North West, or it's an, ex an exit off of Interstate 77. So you now know much more about William McKinley Jr. I hope you found it interesting. I now can try to answer some questions you may have. 